Oto had a distinct recollection that it traveled from east to west from the city toward the hills. It seemed a sheet of sun. Both he and Mr. Matsuo reacted in terror, and both had time to react, for they were 3,500 yards or two miles from the center of the explosion. Mr. Matsuo dashed up the front steps into the house and dived among the bedrolls and buried himself there. Mr. Tanimoto took four or five steps and threw himself between two big rocks in the garden. He bellied up very hard against one of them. As his face was against the stone, he did not see what happened. He felt a sudden pressure, and then splinters and pieces of board and fragments of tile fell on him. He heard no roar. Almost no one in Hiroshima recalls hearing any noise of the bomb. But a fisherman in his sampan on the inland sea near Tsuzu, the man with whom Mr. Tanimoto's mother-in-law and sister-in-law were living, saw the flash and heard a tremendous explosion. He was nearly 20 miles from Hiroshima, but the thunder was greater than when the B-29s hit Iwakuni, only five miles away. When he dared, Mr. Tanimoto raised his head and saw that the rayon man's house had collapsed. He thought a bomb had fallen directly on it. Such clouds of dust had risen that there was a sort of twilight around. In panic, not thinking for the moment of Mr. Matsuo under the ruins, he dashed out into the street. He noticed as he ran that the concrete wall of the estate had fallen over toward the house rather than away from it. In the street, the first thing he saw was a squad of soldiers who had been burrowing into the hillside opposite, making one of the thousands of dugouts in which the Japanese apparently intended to resist invasion, hill by hill, life for life. The soldiers were coming out of the hole where they should have been safe, and blood was running from their heads, chests, and backs. They were silent and dazed. Under what seemed to be a local dust cloud, the day grew darker and darker. Let's pause for a moment and just pay attention. You see it there on page 989, the spiral review diction and tone. What do you notice about Hersey's diction and tone as he describes these awful scenes? Well, jot down in your notes at 2B, what is the tone here? How does Hersey tell the story? For example, does Hersey ever step in and say, can you believe how terrible this is? Can you believe what devastation and destruction? No, 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 right? Notice, all Hersey does, his tone is what? Very straightforward, very to the point. We might even say very unemotional, huh? Now, let's ask the question in 2B. Why do you think that his tone is very unemotional? Why do you think that he doesn't say, can you believe all the terrible things that have happened? No, he doesn't do that. But why? Many have argued that what Hersey wants to do as a journalist is present the facts. Let the reader decide if this is a terrible thing or no. And obviously nobody's going to deny it's a terrible thing. The question obviously is, is it necessary? For example, notice on page 989 what we just read. There were a number of soldiers who were digging in holes and trenches to get ready for a possible coming invasion. There were a lot of people who imagined that Japan's mainland would have to be invaded by American forces and they would have to go town to town, house to house to be able to defeat uh, the Japanese because they were so um, certain they were not going to surrender. Which maybe seems to imply that Hersey is arguing that while this is a terrible thing, it might have been the only way to end the war. Notice he doesn't say it, he just kind of implies it. All right, we now pause on 989. And let's go to our next section. Here we go. At nearly midnight the night before the bomb was dropped, an announcer on the city's radio station said that about 200 B-29s were approaching southern Honshu and advised the population of Hiroshima to evacuate to their designated safe areas. Mrs. Hatsuyo Nakamura, the tailor's widow, who lived in the section called Nobori Cho, and who had long had a habit of doing as she was told, 
got her three children, a 10-year-old boy, Toshio, an eight-year-old girl, Yaeko, and a five-year-old girl, Mieko, out of bed and dressed them and walked with them to the military area known as the East Parade Ground on the northeast edge of the city. There, she unrolled some mats and the children lay down on them. They slept until about two when they were awakened by the roar of the planes going over Hiroshima. As soon as the planes had passed, Mrs. Nakamura started back with her children. They reached home a little after 2.30, and she immediately turned on the radio, which, to her distress, was just then broadcasting a fresh warning. When she looked at the children and saw how tired they were, and when she thought of the number of trips they had made in past weeks, all to no purpose, to the East Parade Ground, she decided that in spite of the instructions on the radio, she simply could not face starting out all over again. She put the children in their bedrolls on the floor, lay down herself at three o'clock, and fell asleep at once, so soundly that when planes passed over later, she did not waken to their sound. The siren jarred her awake at about seven. She arose, dressed quickly, and hurried to the house of Mr. Nakamoto, the head of her neighborhood association, and asked him what she should do. He said that she should remain at home unless an urgent warning, a series of intermittent blasts of the siren, was sounded. She returned home, lit the stove in the kitchen, set some rice to cook, and sat down to read that morning's Hiroshima Chugoku. To her relief, the all clear sounded at eight o'clock. She heard the children stirring, so she went and gave each of them a handful of peanuts and told them to stay in their bedrolls because they were tired from the night's walk. She had hoped they would go back to sleep, but the man in the house directly to the south began to make a terrible hullabaloo of hammering, wedging, ripping, and splitting. The prefectural government, convinced as everyone in Hiroshima was, that the city would be attacked soon, had begun to press with threats and warnings for the completion of wide fire lanes, which it was hoped might act in conjunction with the rivers to localize any fires started by an incendiary raid. And the neighbor was reluctantly sacrificing his home to the city's safety. Just the day before, the prefecture had ordered all able-bodied girls from the secondary schools to spend a few days helping to clear these lanes, and they started work soon after the all clear sounded. Mrs. Nakamura went back to the kitchen, looked at the rice, and began watching the man next door. At first she was annoyed with him for making so much noise, but then she was moved almost to tears by pity. Her emotion was specifically directed toward her neighbor, tearing down his home, board by board, at a time when there was so much unavoidable destruction, but undoubtedly she also felt a generalized community pity, to say nothing of self-pity. She had not had an easy time. Her husband, Isawa, had gone into the army just after Mieko was born, and she had heard nothing from or of him for a long time, until on March 5th, 1942, she received a seven-word telegram. Isawa died an honorable death at Singapore. She learned later that he had died on February 15th, the day Singapore fell, and that he had been a corporal. Isawa had been a not particularly prosperous tailor, and his only capital was a Sankoku sewing machine. After his death, when his allotment stopped coming, Mrs. Nakamura got out the machine and began to take in piecework herself, and since then had supported the children, but poorly, by sewing. As Mrs. Nakamura stood watching her neighbor, everything flashed whiter than any white she had ever seen. She did not notice what happened to the man next door. The reflex of a mother set her in motion toward her children. She had taken a single step the house was 1,350 yards, or three quarters of a mile, from the center of the explosion. 
when something picked her up and she seemed to fly into the next room over the raised sleeping platform, pursued by parts of her house. Timbers fell around her as she landed, and a shower of tiles pummeled her. Everything became dark, for she was buried. The debris did not cover her deeply. She rose up and freed herself. She heard a child cry, Mother, help me, and saw her youngest, Mieko, the five-year-old, buried up to her breast and unable to move. As Mrs. Nakamura started frantically to claw her way toward the baby, she could see or hear nothing of her other children. So it, we, we now have two of the four that will be discussed in our, in our cutting here. And notice the differences in the two. We'll come back to continue our conversation with John Hersey here in a second. Thank you.